Hey everybody, it is Trags Mike Petralia back with the latest episode of the Jungle Vora podcast powered by CLNS Media and our proud sponsors and our partners, of course, Prize Picks and the Game Time app. Joining me on this week's episode of the Jungle Vora pod, someone new to the rotation. This is my fault. I should have had this talented, very informed, very insightful reporter on much before this, but this is her maiden voyage on the Jungle Roar Pod. It's my pleasure to welcome Laurel Failer of the Dayton Daily News, doing a terrific job covering the Cincinnati Bengals for the Dayton Daily News. Laurel, my pleasure to welcome you. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I don't, I'm the quiet one of the group with the Bengals media, so, uh, no worries. You know, that's n- not always a bad thing. You do understand that because you're in between Dan Horde and Ben Baby, both regulars on this podcast, um, and you're very um, indiscriminate or you're very, uh, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? Just very discreet in your presence in the Bengals media room, but it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you. I want to get some insight uh, from you on uh, the Bengals as they wrapped up uh, mandatory minicamp last week. And even when minicamp is over and we think we're going into the quiet season, it's never quiet when you're talking about the NFL. You know that by now, covering the Bengals for as long as you... By the way, how many years have you been covering the Bengals now, if I might ask? Let's see. I think 2015 was the first year I actually was originally helping Jay Morrison when he was at the Dayton yes. Daily News. I was kind of his... I did all the side stories and uh, so sidebars, this- 2024 will mark your 10th year covering the Bengals. Yeah. Uh, if Doesn't my man seem like correct. that long, it's man, it that's goes crazy. like that. Trust me. Um, all right. Uh, the news does never end. It seems T Higgins, the biggest news, I think of the weekend, everybody would agree signing his $21.8 million franchise tag tender from the Bengals, really a formality. He was never going to hold out, but the difference here as opposed to what happened with Jesse Bates uh, before the 2022 season, is there will be no uh, watch. There'll be no uh, franchise tag player watch heading into training camp. It's one less distraction that these Bengals have to be concerned about going into the season. I think that's a great thing uh, for Zach Taylor, and I think that's why you saw on Monday Zach Taylor come out with the official team statement that T. Higgins handled handled this contract situation and this uncertainty the right way. Uh, What did you make of uh, Zach Taylor coming out and kind of throwing his support behind T in that manner? Well, it's not surprising. I feel like he's such a player's coach. He's going to support his players. Uh, But yeah, I think that I don't remember. Maybe maybe it went that way with Jesse Bates once he finally, I mean, he always said positive things about Jesse and they weren't worried about him, but I think he probably does appreciate that T, you know, got this done and He's going to be there for training camp. To me, it's a signal that T. Higgins wants this team to win. And whereas Jesse Bates maybe could, you know, sit out through part of training camp, I feel like on offense, you really need that chemistry between. And even though T. Higgins and Joe Burrow obviously have chemistry, they need to get that going again before the season. And so I think that it's kind of a sign that he recognizes that and wants to be a part of a successful season with the Bengals. And uh, so go on and get it done. I don't blame him for waiting till the end of OTAs, you know, not really much to gain there. He didn't really need to be there. So um, it makes sense to me to, to go on and get it done, enjoy the summer and then come back. And, you know, all that buzz is kind of out of the way a little bit. Right. Can just get to work. And it's also important to know, and, and many informed Bengal fans already know this, by him waiting until after mandatory minicamp to sign, it means he doesn't get penalized because you're not going to sign the franchise tag. Then you're under contract. Then you're required to be at minicamp or you get fined. Well, yeah. obviously, as soon as minicamp ended, uh, he said, well, it's time for me to end it and sign and be ready uh, come the beginning of training camp. And I th- don't think that's really a surprise to anybody. I did find it significant, Laurel. Uh, that Joe Burrow said he had had contact with T, thinks that he is in great shape. And I think that is a sign from Joe that, yes, Jamar is important, like you said, to the offense. But like you also said, having T and Jamar together, when you're talking about bringing in some new weapons into the offense and developing some second-year players like Andre Yoshivash and um, obviously Charlie Jones, 
when you throw all of that into the mix, I think that's significant to Joe Burrow. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, maybe it was almost a not a positive that Jamar and T weren't at OTAs, but the fact that those younger guys and guys that really needed the reps were able to to get that work in with Joe right. Burrow, I think that probably ended up being more valuable than anything than and I mean Jamar Chase being around that last week, uh, you know, we heard how he was still involved with you know, discussions with the, the receivers. And um, so I, I feel like it, it went about as well as it could have. So I'm just going to make an observation here. For a team that has so many high-profile players at skill positions, Joe Burrow, obviously, he signed his $219 million extension last year, Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. This team doesn't have a lot of drama. And I think that's a credit to these players who really with Joe Burrow at the top of the pecking order, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> the priority is on winning. There isn't a lot of drama when it comes to contracts. And I think the Bengals benefit from that. Uh, and on a lot, we see it all, all the time. There are teams where the player becomes the bigger story than the team trying to win. And you don't see that here in Cincinnati. And I think that's very good for, for the Bengals going forward, at least in the near future. Yeah, I mean, we'll still be talking about Jamar Chase's contract extension, but you're sure, right. There's but, no drama but, around but not, it. And yeah. Not right. to interrupt you, but the drama won't be distraction. Big difference between everybody wondering maybe when is a Jamar Chase contract going to get done, as opposed to a storyline being fed into by the agent or by uh, the player himself or by the organization, which does happen in the NFL, if a team wants to kind of knock the player down a few notches for, you know, bargaining position uh, in negotiations, they'll do that. That doesn't happen here with the Bengals. The only instance really in the off season, uh, Laurel, where it did happen was with uh, Trey Hendrickson yep. and him making the trade demand, <laughs> uh, seeing as though he wanted, you know, to be, better compensated but then he realized within about i don't know five hours three hours maybe less than that that oh yeah i did sign last year and i signed the one year uh extension so i really don't have any bargaining power i'm just trying to you know make a statement that i should be better appreciated by the team yeah which is kind of ironic to me because you know with how he deals with us i mean he doesn't like to do the whole media thing so the fact that he was kind of the one out there making a story, you know, maybe through his agent or whatever. But um, that, it just, I found that kind of ironic. But yeah, he, I mean, he, you know, first day back to work and he could have still gone on and sat out until mini camp and he went on and showed up and uh, got his work in and right. took, you know, took questions from us, even though it's not his favorite thing to do. So it didn't end up being a big thing, which is, I think is totally your point. Just it's not. Even if there is drama, it's not a distraction. And I will, even though we would have loved to have had Jamar Chase talk during minicamp, he declined after every practice and Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And while it would have been great for our purposes, it's actually, I think, very good for the team that he kept his mouth shut and kept it all business. And if I'm Zach Taylor, I love the fact that he didn't talk because there's no drama being uh, perpetuated in over the summer, over the summer break, five, six weeks, whatever it is, into the opening of training camp because Jamar said this back in June. Yeah, I, you know, I was joking that maybe he really just was got, he got teased over winning our media award. And so he had to back <laughs> off the interviews for a little bit. <laughs> didn't want to come off as too media friendly for a little while, but no, I mean, I think that's that's a good point, though. Yeah, I, and look, I think when Jamar does finally decide to talk, he will be a soundbite a minute, it, maybe even more. He is that kind of guy. Just because I think when Jamar Chase talks, it's definitely heartfelt and there's no filter. I think when T. Higgins talks, it's also honest, it's also heartfelt, but it's not nearly as incendiary if you want if you will or uh it won't spark as much controversy i don't think as when jamar chase talks yeah i think they're i mean they're very different 
individuals i feel like Very. just in their personalities and yeah jamar you're you're completely i mean that's why we enjoy him because he doesn't have the filter but obviously those two have been great to both to both of them have been great to us always doing interviews and making themselves available you know pretty much once a week at least during the season so sorry were you gonna say something oh no i was just <laughs> going to say now that we've wrapped up the big names t higgins and and jamar chase there uh who impressed you of the rookies and or second year receivers charlie jones and um yoshi uh who who, who impressed you over the last four weeks of offseason practice i think yoshi would be i i feel like he i mean we always knew he had this athleticism and i just feel like he's kind of taken it to the next level where he's maybe like soaked in everything he learned last year and now we're kind of seeing it i felt like he really stood out to me um you know i i think jermaine burton's gonna be fun to watch just what he brings um to the to the offense but right. uh Yoshi, I think is, I, you know, there was so much hype around him last year. So I feel like maybe I shouldn't go that route, but he's the one that stood out the most. I guess what sticks out to me about Yoshi is that he looks bigger. He looks stronger. We already know he's fast. And when you put all of that into the box, you think T Higgins, the next T Higgins. I don't know if the Bengals have plans to place him in the same positions and the same route trees uh, as T Higgins. We'll, we'll see how the off season uh, unfolds, how training camp unfolds, I should say, and how new offensive coordinator Dan Picture chooses to use a guy like Andre Yoshivash in the offense. I think Picture is going to be aggressive in using him because I think Pitcher believes that there's more that they can do and show more versatility within the offense than they could last year. Yeah, and I mean, the way Joe Burrow talked about how the offense is really going to attack defenses and make them adjust to to the, what the Bengals are doing, I feel like we're going to end up seeing a lot of different guys getting opportunities that, you know, we saw some of these guys, but we they really relied on the big three last year. And I think that they understand that they need some different weapons and they have guys that are maybe not going to be around in the future. They need to start, you know, making sure that they – have these guys ready and you never know when injuries are going to pop up. So I think that that's going to be a big part of what Joe was talking about with the eye candy. I don't think it's just like different. I think it's different personnel, different groupings. Just, I think it's yeah. going to be a lot different this year. Uh, yeah. And to your point there, Laurel, I think Dan picture is going to put out players that have, you know, on film earned the respect of the opposing defensive coordinator a little bit more than was the case last year. And guys, that when they're on the field, what Joe Burrow means by eye candy is defensive coordinators have to go, oh, that player is on the field. We have to make sure we don't totally ignore him. That's what yeah. Joe Burrow means by eye candy. And I think when you have, let's say, three or four of those players on the field at once as opposed to one or two, makes a huge difference. The other thing I'm fascinated to see is Mike Kosicki's role in this this offense. Yeah. I don't think he is going to be used as a traditional tight end in the Bengals offense that we have seen the last three years. Yeah, I mean, he's talked a lot about just playing in the slot and his experience playing different spots. And um, yeah, I think that he's I mean, it seemed like he was really working on his chemistry with Joe Burrow. Like those yes. two seemed like they were really getting on the same page. And I think that's going to be really key. And yeah, a big part of that eye candy, just having him in different spots and what he can do also just, you know, maybe changing things around with, you know, you don't have Tyler Boyd. And so that slot position looks a little different. Maybe they can do it a little different with Mike Gusecki. And then we'll see what Jermaine Burton and, uh, you know, Jamar Chase obviously can play inside as well. So we'll see. Uh, I, I think it'll be fun to watch in training camp. The other, the point that uh, Richard Skinner, Skinny, made last week on this podcast about Chase Brown I found was a fascinating one, and that is Zach Taylor made a point of singling out what Chase Brown was able to do when he was given just one or two words of coaching and suggestive improvements that he could make in the offseason. He took that and ran with it and came back and came to offseason workouts a different-looking player. You're going to see a lot more of Chase Brown this year. I don't think that's any secret. But I'm curious to see how Dan Picture uses and compliments Chase Brown with Zach Moss, the uh, veteran free agent that was signed uh, off the Colts roster. 
Yeah, it seems like um, just what he's going to be able to do in the passing game. It seems like that's really where he's going to make that big leap that, yeah, I, I mean, it seems everyone was really impressed with Chase Brown, and he's another one that you would have to point out as one of the, I guess, winners of the offseason program. Just yep. people really noticed the improvements that he made. And, like, we, we saw some good things last year, but, you know, that injury that he suffered – Kind of, he felt like he was kind of just getting things going, and then got injured, and then yep. comes back, and you know starts getting going pretty nicely to finish the season. But I think the fact that he was able to take some coaching and really, you know, pinpoint what he needed to work on for the off season, and took that to heart, and then we kind of saw it this this off season workout program. I think that's we're going to see it even more in training camp. It'll be fun to watch. I don't think the situation's too big for Chase Brown. There's an energy about him. When we're, you know, some things that the fans don't get to see that we do as reporters uh, inside the locker room is the vibe when you're around a player day after day after day. And while we weren't there day after day, we were there week after week after week in offseason. Chase Brown looks very comfortable and very confident. Oh, yeah. He does exude that confidence. I feel like. I mean, I felt like even when he came in, he wasn't this shy rookie. Like he was willing to talk to us right away. And yep. um, I mean, you see it on the field. I, I just don't ever get the impression that he like, even if there were things he needed to work on, I felt like he just believed he could do it. And we're, yeah, that's, I think that's going to be a, bit, a big key for him in his second year that, I mean, they talk, coaches talk about confidence and what that can do for especially young players. If they, if they can, believe in themselves and just put it on in action on the field. And I think we'll see that from Chase Brown. Year two in the NFL, it's a cliche. It has been for years and years and years in the National Football League is when coaching staffs look at those players entering their second year. That's when they expect them to make the biggest jump because they have had an off season with the team, not having to worry about uh, the NFL combine starting in January and getting ready for it leading up to March in Indianapolis and getting ready for the draft and whatnot. So I think that is going to be the case with Chase Brown. I think you're going to see even, even your point is a good one. He was competent last year, but now I think we're seeing he feels like he has a better command of what's expected of him in the offense. I want to get your impression of Ted Karras and him signing the one-year extension and why you think that was, I know you wrote about it for the Dayton Daily News, why you think that was a good deal for both the team and Ted Karras? Well, I mean, we all know what a leader he is and just the consistency he's provided just in availability. Um, you know, being on the field counts for something. And so, yes, um, I mean, we we love him because he he's always willing to talk to us, but I mean, the fans can see everything he's done for the community. Like he's really immersed himself in the community through a charitable project with the Cincy Hat uh, project, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, even though that's based in his hometown, the village of Marici. Marici. I always yes. say that wrong. Okay. Village of Marici. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's it's from his hometown, but he's really connected it to the Cincinnati fan base through the hats and just the different designs and people love those. So, uh, you know, he's just one of those guys you like to have around. And then, you know, it was kind of, we kind of could see there was probably something coming when they didn't draft anyone. And he even said that he was watching the draft, waiting to see if they were going to pick up his future replacement. And, you know, they got Matt Lee in the seventh round, but, um, you know, Ted is a guy that kind of, kind of mentor him and mentor the young offensive lineman in that room. And I think that that's a big key. And so just having him locked down for another year, that that's going to enable him to play more freely. You know, he doesn't have that pressure of I've got to play for a contract. That's not going to be on his mind this year. So I think that's, that's the big key for the Bengals and for him just to not have to worry about that and know that he, you've got a veteran in that offensive line room that you can count on. I think I think I remember Ted talking about this the first time we spoke to him after the draft. And I remember him saying, I knew when they didn't draft a center on the first two days of the draft, that would be the first, second, and third rounds, I was okay. Yeah. Because he knows that if you're drafting a center uh, fourth and fifth and sixth, and as it turned out in the seventh round, 
that's usually more of a development project. You're not going to take usually a six rounder and throw him right into the starting uh, role in, in the National Football League, unless you're Tom Brady. Um, but certainly with Matt Lee, I think Matt Lee's going to have time uh, to develop behind not only Ted Karras, but Trey Hill. So that is something that uh, warrants uh, following. But I think we all love Ted because he's so o- open and honest. I'll give you an example, Laurel. When I think it was Jay Morrison asked, so what's the contract? And Ted took a second and said, sure, I'll tell you, it's two, 212, meaning two years, $12 million extension. There are a lot of players who'd be uncomfortable saying anything in terms of the value of their contract, but Ted just brushed it off his shoulder and said, yeah, I'll tell you. To, to me, that's just kind of an indication of you get what you see, what you get, you, you get what you see, whatever. Um, what you see is what you get. Thank yeah. you, Mike. Uh, <laughs> but that's what Ted Karras is. Yeah, that. And, you know, that's also awareness that it's going to come out anyway. There's no reason not to tell us if someone asks. You know what I mean, Laurel, Yeah, no, He's very straightforward. Yeah, he is very straightforward. And I feel like that's why we tend to go to him a lot when we need quotes on anything because he's he's straightforward. And, um, yeah, I I think that's that's who Ted is. Well, and the other thing, the other part of that, and probably the more important part of that to the organization is he's straightforward with us. He's very straightforward as a team captain, as a leader uh, inside that locker room, especially on the offensive line unit. But throughout the locker room, he is somebody that if a player has an issue, whether it's with the organization, facilities, we can get to that in a second, facilities and or how the team is treating the players, you go to Ted Karras and he will represent you. He'll tell you the situation. He'll tell you, okay, yeah, I can bring that up or mm, that's not really a battle worth fighting and here's why. I love that aspect of Ted Karras and I think the organization does too. Yeah, I think that when Zach Taylor was talking about how some veteran players came to him and talked to him about how, because the locker rooms are under construction and yes. You know, the players aren't all together. He kind of, I, I think he was talking about Ted Karras. He didn't name anyone, but he said some veterans came to him and said, you know, we're not really getting a chance to get to know these young, new guys on the team because, you know, we need to make sure we're having some more team meetings or do something so that we're all together more. And Zach took that to heart. And I, I, I'm almost positive that had to have been Ted Karras. Yeah, I, I would, would agree with you talking with, Laurel Failer of Dayton Daily News covering the Cincinnati Bengals and the National Football League. Hard knocks. This is a different twist this year, and the Bengals are involved in it. This will be technically their third season on hard knocks in 09 and in 2013. Those were the traditional uh, episodes in which, for like the first 15 years, 16 years or so, they took a team and, and followed them. In the preseason, like, of course, this past year with Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets and Robert Salah, they followed the Jets in preseason. Then they uh, took it a step further. They followed the Cardinals, I believe it was, and the Miami Dolphins in season. Now this year, they are focusing, starting in December, on an entire division, the AFC North. And the reason I find this interesting is not just because the Bengals are involved, But what uh, Zach Taylor has always insisted and said about the uh, AFC North, I don't think I know it is the best division in football. I love that part of the press release statement that the Bengals uh, put out on Monday. But your thoughts on the Bengals uh, being uh, part of this uh, hard knock special series, hard knocks uh, inside the AFC North? Well, I admit I was a little surprised that they would agree to it, but I feel like, well, if the rest of the division agreed and the Steelers, who I don't believe have, I think that was in the press release, they haven't been a part of Hard Knocks. So if they agreed, you got to kind of go along with it. But uh, no, I think it's going to be a great look into just look what it's the last six weeks of the season. And just hopefully it's, I mean, it was four teams that made or had winning records last year. Um, we're f- pushing for the playoffs. Obviously, the Bengals missed out, but um, I think that'll be interesting. Uh, hopefully, it, it pans out to where it's kind of the same and everyone's competing till the end and it makes it really interesting. But just the, what you were talking about earlier with how this team doesn't have the distractions, I just think that's probably why I was surprised is that, you know, that does seem like it could be something that's a distraction, but it'll be interesting to see how they handle it. 
I'm curious to see how a player like Jamar Chase handles it because that could be a big platform and they could catch Jamar in moments, in unguarded moments. And I, I think that would be hilarious. It could be hilarious uh, or it could be a fire starter and something that maybe Zach Taylor doesn't want to have to deal with. But he, you know what? He's dealt with enough players over the, his first five years as an NFL head coach. I don't think it will overwhelm him. And that's why, you know, that's another reason why I think Zach Taylor didn't have as much of a problem signing off on it. Yeah, I mean, it's a locker room that I'm sure can handle it. It'll just be interesting because it is in the thick of the season where, you know, you don't really want the distractions. But, you know, if that does say that he has confidence they can handle it or he they would not have agreed, even with the pressure, I guess, of the other teams agree. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I think that there could be more pressures. Of, I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but certainly – I think there could be more intensity when you're following a team like John Harbaugh and the Baltimore Ravens than the Bengals. The Bengals, I think, are focused, and certainly in the 21 and 22 seasons, very focused, but you never got the feeling that it was this mounting pressure, which is why I think they were able to string together those eight wins and they were able able to overcome um, – you know, what happened uh, to Mar Hamlin uh, late in the season, they weren't, they didn't lose their focus. Yeah, it was a terrible story, but they managed to, you know, compartmentalize. And I think the Bengals do a really good job of that. The other teams in that division, the Browns, Steelers, and Ravens, certainly with the Steelers and Ravens, have very intense coaches, and that can go one of two ways. Yeah. Some interesting characters, too, that I think, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they get portrayed in this um, just having that inside access. And like you were talking about with Jamar, like there's, I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what, what players surprise us from the other teams. Yes, I am too. Uh, anything else you're working on as you uh, head into the summer months? Well, I do. I mean, I get paid per story, so I'm always trying to <laughs> fill content, but uh, no. Um, yeah. I'm, I was following up on Dax Hill, just, you know, his, transition to cornerback you know we talked to him right at the beginning of when we found out he was making that change and mm -hmm. he sounds a little bit more comfortable now I, I think that's something that I, I think I have a story coming out tomorrow on that but um yeah just he was kind of talking about how everyone kind of views him as this versatile guy and oh yeah he's played corner before he could do this but he was saying like I really haven't played a lot of outside corner so it was an adjustment at the beginning and you know, he watched a lot of film, um, took a lot of, you know, he credited the coaching that he's gotten and um, he's trying not to view it as a competition. So there's not that added pressure of that, but I think it will be a fun competition to watch in, in training camp just to see what happens between him and DJ Turner. Obviously the focus is on the players. It's going to come down to Dax Hill and DJ Turner, like you said, but I don't think, the Bengals would take a chance of moving Dax into that position if they didn't have a guy like Charles Burks that the, that Zach absolutely respects to the highest order. Charles Burks has really worked hard on his craft, working with a lot of rookies and younger players in the in the secondary in the corners, and we've seen what he's been able to do with Cam Taylor Britt, who I think could turn into an All Pro this year. Oh, yeah. I. I I think a lot of people are very high on that on him and for very good reason, you know, and I don't think the Bengals would be entrusting Dax Hill with just anybody. I think Charles Burks should get a lot of credit for the way he's developed a lot of the young corners in that secondary. Yeah. And that was something that Dax specifically pointed out his work with Chuck. They always call him Chuck. Yes. Um, how just how he's worked well with him and, you know, just in the film room, especially. And yeah, I think that's going to be a big key that, you know, Dax has the tools. He's athletic, fast. They can do a lot. And you know, they've been talking about his versatility since they drafted him. So um, to see what coach Burks can do with that, will be, I mean, we saw it. At, I felt like he looked pretty good. I mean, the defense kind of stood out in mini camp over the offense anyway, but he was one of those players out there flying around, making some plays. So, I think it'll be fun to watch. 
Well, I know you do uh, also tremendous work for Queen City Press covering FC Cincinnati, and that's going to be taking up a lot of your summer as well as we look forward to uh, training camp. By the way, the training camp uh, schedule has been released. There are 10 public practices open for training camp, and that begins on July 29th. Camp doesn't begin July 29th. Camp begins July 24th. Uh, but the first uh, training camp practice open to the public, it will be a Monday, July 29th. That'll be uh, gates opening at 1.30, practice 2.15 to 4.10, and I'm sure it'll be a nice, cool 95 degrees with about 65% humidity. What do you think, Laurel? I feel like it's going to feel a lot like this week. Yeah, <laughs> and we're going to not want to be out there. <laughs> but I, I think you know me by now. I embrace the heat. Heat does not okay. bother me. I'm the one who usually when it's below 75 degrees who comes in with a jacket and a hoodie on in the press room. You do know that about me, right? Yeah, but you can break out your Hawaiian shirts and, you know, your they we'll uh, we are, <laughs> We're actually moving. Lovely Deborah Ann and, and myself are moving but the Hawaiian shirts are protected, packed away. They are not getting thrown out mysteriously in the move. So they will be making another appearance at training camp 2024 for the Bengals. We'll Just be so looking you know. forward to that. I'm sure everybody in the press corps will be. Well, I want to really thank you very much, Laurel Thaler, for uh, joining me on this episode of the podcast of the Jungle Roar podcast. Did you have fun? Yeah, it was a great time. I always enjoy talking with you, Trags. I appreciate Likewise, Laurel. But I'm a little for... disappointed you're leaving me in Liberty Township without any, you know, I'm the furthest one away. Well, Jay's okay. pretty far too. Yeah. Full disclosure, um, the commute got to be a bit much. Yeah. And yeah. Um, now uh, I will not be screaming about the traffic when I roll into Paycor Stadium. Uh, it'll be a happier Trags when you see me roll in in the summertime. <laughs> That's my promise. My Boy Scouts honor that uh, I will not be complaining about the traffic. It'll be I'm a much better hold game. you to it. Yeah, please do. All right. She is Laurel Failer, does a terrific job covering the Cincinnati Bengals for the Dayton Daily News. I want to thank our great sponsors, Prize Picks and the Game Time app. And of course, our terrific staff at CLNS Media for helping getting this podcast on all of our platforms. Until next week, keep that jungle roaring.